I'm going to be reading an essay that, was, that I wrote that's in this issue that's called um, I'm Not Talking to Anybody. And perhaps one of the reasons that it's good that this essay is being read not by somebody who is a professional performer is that it features a large number of footnotes. <laughs> and I will, I think that as I read it, you will, I hope, understand why some of those footnotes are there. And I'm going to read you some of those footnotes because what does it mean to hear an essay and not to hear the footnotes? What I'm reading comes from the middle of the essay. It starts with a section called, At the Bedside, 2014. I am sitting in a lovely private room, easily the nicest hospital room we have been in during this current journey through the New York City hospital system. Oh, there's a footnote. <laughs> Nicer than the double room at Hospital A, where my mother recuperated after the hip surgery. Nicer than the ICU room at Hospital A. Nicer than the double room at Hospital B, where I took such comfort in the academic stroke team. Nicer than the rooms at Rehab C, where she groaned and moaned, but occasionally took comfort, ate yogurt, and listened to music. Nicer than the single room at Rehab D that we were so proud to achieve, where no one ever came in, no matter what. <laughs> End of footnote. So. As I was saying, easily the nicest hospital room we have been in during this current journey through the New York City hospital system, looking out the window over the upper reaches of Central Park, and sometimes when I stand up to approach the bed, looking down at the people walking, scootering, hailing cabs, and thinking, as one does, about all the hundreds and thousands and millions of people going on with their lives and not in this hospital room. Footnote about footnotes. No accident that this week in the personal essay writing course that I teach in the NYU journalism department, I assigned for a class on travel essays the David Foster Wallace essay, Shipping Out. So you can see what inspired all these footnotes, including this particularly self-referential one and the David Sedaris essay, Journey in Tonight, which includes a reflection on precisely this subject, quote, I could feel him watching as I cut into my herb-encrusted chicken, most likely wondering how anyone could carry on at a time like this. That's how I felt when my mother died. The funeral took place on a Saturday afternoon in November. It was unseasonably warm that day, even for Raleigh. And returning from the church, we passed people working on their lawns as if nothing had happened. One guy even had his shirt off. Can you beat that, I said to my sister Lisa not thinking of all the funeral processions that had passed me over the years, me laughing, me throwing stones at signs, me trying to stand on my bicycle seat. Close quotes, out of footnotes. Back to the hospital room. And in the bed is my mother, my dear mother, my mother whom I have helped walk all over Trinidad in 2003, all over India in 2005, and more recently, all over New York City, my still teaching professor writer mother, who had, she said, the most exciting day of her life last November, when the New York Times ran her new old age column, and she got hundreds of online responses. My mother, who was ecstatic at the Globe 12th night just three months ago, now lying on her left side in a light blue hospital johnny with her mouth open in a rictus of agony and despair. Please help me, she cries. Help me, help me, please, help me. Her eyes are closed as she says this over and over. Sometimes she weeps. Occasionally she slips into what looks like sleep, but after a few minutes she stirs. Her right hand claws the air, and then it comes again. Help, help, help. Oh God, please God, somebody help me. She cries, ow, 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 ow. Though when I ask her whether she has any pain, she says no. When I say I love you, mama, she replies obediently, and I love you. When I try to give her an ice chip, she calls me a bastard. I have been here since 7.30 a.m. and it is now 3.30 in the afternoon. She has been crying out like this all day. I have asked the resident to come and assess her at least three times, and he has come. I have had them give her Haldol and Dilaudid and more Haldol and more Dilaudid. 
I have asked the resident to call the geriatrics team and see if they have any more ideas. They don't. I have stood in the room at the bedside and sobbed hysterically. I have stood out in the hallway to get a break from the agony of my, of my mother. I have conducted journalism department business on my cell phone with tears running down my cheeks. The resident says to me, I can just imagine if this were my mother, and I understand this to be the equivalent of spitting to ward off the evil eye. The younger, less convincing intern, who was here on the night I stayed over, said the same thing when I asked him to assess her pain. If this were my mother, I wouldn't want her feeling like this. And he gave her more dilated. Perhaps they use this particular trope because I am a doctor. I confess that I wear my Bellevue badge on its Bellevue lanyard round my neck when I walk into hospital E, so everyone who deals with me can see the MD on my chest. Footnote. In this odyssey through the New York City medical world, I have worn that ID in and out of every facility. The only place where I was ever given a second look was at Rehab D, a place that was not a good place for Mama, a place where she deteriorated unwatched. They may not have paid much attention to her pain, but they were vigilant about my ID. And the first time I tried to walk past the security desk there, the man behind the desk scrutinized me and asked, are you a family member or are you here professionally? But no one at Hospital A or Hospital B or Rehab C or Hospital E has ever looked, let alone asked. Out of footnote, back to the story. Perhaps that ID helps them identify. Perhaps that helps the residents be kind, as each of them thinks, here's a doctor watching her mother deteriorate. I, too, am a doctor, and I, too, have a mother. Checking messages. I kept on working while my mother was so sick, but everything came back to her. When I taught my graduate class on travel essays, I found that I was really teaching about my mother, telling my students about how the two of us had traveled together and then written about it, but then finding myself in that discussion of life as a journey and where that journey takes us all. When the editor at the New York Times asked me to write a column about a new study coming out in pediatrics, guess what? It turned out to be about my mother. The study looked at adults' use of mobile devices as they sat in restaurants with young children. In other words, the Times was interested in whether cell phones were distracting parents from their children. So I wrote the piece about how children can feel hurt, neglected, overlooked when they can't get a parent's attention. Yes, the experts confirmed that face-to-face -face interaction is the most important thing. I clucked over the parents who can't put down their devices. But I also commented on the long and boring periods of supervising young children and on the hazards of judging parents by every new rubric. But what I was really thinking about the whole time that I was writing this was how I would stand at my mother's bedside in the hospital clutching my cell phone. I would feed her some yogurt and then tap in my four-digit password. I would tell her how I loved her and then I would check my voicemail. I would tell her she was going to get better and then I would scan my email. And it wasn't just me. The doctors taking care of my mother took cell phone calls, excusing themselves and stepping out of the room. The nurses were glued to their computers on wheels, scanning my mother's ID bracelet, entering all meds on the screen. Oh, you could see why these actions might make sense as safety measures. But the upshot was that even nurses didn't actually look at the patient. They scanned, typed, tapped, and documented ferociously but they remained focused on the screen until they pushed the portable computer station out of the room and on to the next bar-coded bracelet, summoned by messages on their voice pagers. All of us, all of us at the sick bed were constantly sending and receiving messages. It was yet another twist on parents and children and mobile devices, I would think, looking at my mother, who always refused to use a cell phone. In the hospital, she was cut off from the world, and we were all of us, even me, checking messages and sending messages. The revolution will be televised, the social protest will be twittered, the deathbed will be attended by smartphones, everyone standing around the bed will be instant messaging, tweeting, checking Facebook, a ringtone will interrupt the proceedings every few minutes, and people will clutch their pockets. The geriatrics team was as nice as could be, 
They were sane, humane, good at talking to patients, even difficult patients, respectful of the humanity of those who are voyaging off into dementia, I'm sure. But as we sat down in the family room for a conference to be conducted with all due interpersonal skills, the attending kept stepping out to answer his cell phone, and the fellow was tapping messages into her cell phone all through the discussion, looking up at every turn to let me know that this was all clinically relevant. She was sending messages to the resident to order the special cushion, get the new ointment for sacral ulcer, be sure to include all of that in the discharge notes for rehab F. But I could not be too self-righteous since I, after all, took calls myself at my mother's bedside. I would be cheering her on, you're better and stronger than you were a week ago, which was somewhat true. And my cell phone would ring and I would say, Excuse me, Mama, I have to answer a call about getting you out of here, which was also true. And I would step outside the room with real relief. The outside world was on the line. Thank you. <laughs>